two brothers. One has lived the American dream, star athlete, scholar, professor, writer. The other, the younger of the two, has lived the American nightmare. He's in prison, sentenced to life without parole. Brothers and Keepers is the name of the book written by one of them based on conversations and letters with the other. The book is a plea to give his brother another chance. I knew it would take something like 10 years in prison to make me turn around, to make me do what I could do. Robbie Weidman, the younger of the two brothers, grew up in the streets of Homewood, a black neighborhood in Pittsburgh. Today, if you look at the distance, he lives not far away, only a few miles. But the reality of his home is light years away. For nine years, Robbie Weidman has lived behind the walls of the state penitentiary in Pittsburgh. This cell block is home now. In 1975, he and two friends got into an argument with a fourth man over stolen property. Crooks stealing from crooks. The fourth man was shot and because of medical negligence, bled to death. Even though another man pulled the trigger, Robbie Weidman was convicted of murder. His sentence? Life without parole. Robbie's older brother, John Weidman, is a professor of literature at the University of Wyoming and an award-winning writer with a half dozen novels and short stories to his credit. Back in 1963, when he was just 21, Look Magazine called him the astonishing John Weidman. He was a star basketball player, captain of his team at the University of Pennsylvania, an honor student, Phi Beta Kappa. He wrote poetry and plays. He won a Rhodes Scholarship to study at Oxford, only the second black American to win that honor. I wanted to be Horatio Alger. I was going to play in the NBA. There seemed to be no limits uh, as I looked outside of myself. That was one side of it. The other side of it was um, clearly being black meant that uh, you had to had to pretend about a lot of things you just didn't deal with him yeah they had to go in the back of your mind i mean i i knew that i wasn't horatio alger i knew that i was a black kid sometimes in the district of homewood sometimes in shady side and that meant that uh, the world was not my oyster but john weidman has made a success of his life he and his wife have built a comfortable home in laramie they have three bright children john has time to write his latest book brothers and keepers is his argument his case that his brother deserves another chance he doesn't want to forget his mistakes he doesn't want to forget the past he wants to look directly at it he wants to have a chance to atone he wants to change is this just a case of two brothers one blessed with talent and fortune the other short on ability and predestined for failure each getting what he deserves well, in his nine years in prison, Robbie Weidman has earned an associate degree in engineering and teaches math to other inmates. Why did he go wrong? Do you think that, that what you experienced at home in Homewood in the 50s, when you grew up as a teenager, mm -hmm. was very different from what your brother experienced when he grew up as a teenager ten years later? Yeah, as different as night and day. It was, it was very treacherous in the streets when Robbie was coming up. Treacherous uh, because, uh, number one, dope was, uh, was on the streets in great quantities. Starting about in 1968, uh, you could go into a drugstore and pick up the works, your works, syringes. They were just, they just sold over the counter. But was life in the streets when you grew up that much different? What was normal for you? Was there no street crime? Were there no drugs? Was there no poverty? The community itself was much more closely knit. It was much more like a small town, a small southern town. Uh, you, you, if, 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 as a kid, if I went out in the street, uh, somebody on some porch, Mrs. Ellis, would be checking me out. If I went too far or did something I wasn't supposed to do, she certainly would tell my mother. The crime was petty ante stuff. Um, and usually not directed with any kind of brutality or viciousness uh, inside of the uh, community. You got in trouble, your, your mother punished you. Exactly. Right? Why didn't her firm hand work with Robbie? I think his, his peer group was much stronger and the people that he could look to outside of the family had an awful lot of influence on him. Robbie was part of a part of a world which was a street world, 
and I don't mean uh, a, a bad kid world. I just mean that that he took care of his business outside of the house. He had a circle of friends. Uh, he had uh, he had uh, places that he liked to hang out, and he seemed to uh, be much more uh, a part of that world than the world of, of of the family. John Weidman and Robbie Weidman came out of the same neighborhoods, the same loving family. If there was so much love, when, when your mother said, Robbie, don't, when she smacked you, when she disciplined you, mm -hmm. you never listen. And you, it, it's not as if you had no example to follow. Mm -hmm. Well, it was the kind of love that, you know, I hung on my mother. I'm her youngest child. I hung and hugged. And I was spoiled, you know, and I got my way. And so when she said, Robbie, don't, I just pouted for a little while. You know, and until she would say, okay, baby, come here, and, you know, and hug me. And then I knew somewhere in the head said, okay, you can go ahead and do what you want to do now. You got her, you know, like most kids do their mom. And, and, you know, I don't think it diminished the fact that I loved her. It was just that, you know, I'd learned how to get my own way, you know, and so I went about doing that. The brothers agree there was so much they shared in common, but growing up 10 years apart in the 50s and 60s, was like growing up in two different worlds. This country in the 50s was kind of like in a law. Everything was nice. By the time the 60s came around and the time I grew up, those things had started to change. Uh, my generation started seeing the contradiction in the things that they were telling us. These changes weren't really happening. You know, uh, especially for young black kids, these things weren't really happening. We were still getting turned away. I can still remember going home with my little buddy, who's a white child, and having his mother say, what did you bring that nigga home for? That word, hitting Robbie, um, probably hit him more strongly than it hit me because the, his expectations had been raised. You had the civil rights movement. You, you, had the, you had a voice like Malcolm X. You had a voice like Martin Luther King. And they seemed to be saying that the world had changed, that things were different. But I knew that I couldn't believe what those folks out there were saying because it was quite clear it wasn't true, that we weren't equal, we didn't have equal shots, uh, black people didn't do as well as white people, uh, didn't live in homes that were as nice, didn't have cars, didn't have money. And what he faced? What he faced was a kind of ambiguity. Uh, an external world that says, yes, we want you, it's your time, your time is now, do the right thing and you're going to make it. Um, but at the same time, having, having the rug pulled out from under him continu continually. I expected the rug to be pulled out from me. I didn't expect the rug to be there. I didn't even expect the floor to be there. We wanted change. We wanted things to get right. We wanted to be able to believe in our country and believe in the things that we were being told. But the contradictions were there. And the majority of all the guys that I grew up with are now either in jail, they're dead, they're in the streets strung out on drugs. And, um, you know, that, that says it there, that very few of us made it through. Very few of us made it through. One thing that, that really strikes me in the book was a passage in which you described the way you were. Stone gangsters waving guns in people's faces. It was cowboy and Indian stuff, like the old days. Bang, bang, I got you. Mm -hmm. But those guns were real. Right. And a man did get killed. Right. You didn't pull the trigger, but a man got killed. Well, that, that was part of my problem. Uh, you know, I saw the world, as it says in the book, as a fantasy. I was always on stage. Everything was a game. And that's one of the, the greatest problems that I had. It's one of the things that I had to analyze in those hours in the cell. Quit playing a role. You're not an actor. This is life. You're living it. This is the real thing. You know, this isn't a stage. But uh, back then, it, it was a stage. Robbie, there, there are a lot, of, a lot of baby brothers who come up and who find themselves as a teenager, the last one left at home with aging parents, and they don't end up in prison. True. Well, I, you know, I don't try to make that the excuse, uh, you know, and I have no excuses, really. I have to own up to being in here. You know, we have free will, and that's the bottom line, you know, and I chose the wrong road. All I can say now is, you know, I, I can have this regret for choosing the wrong road. Now, when I looked at Robbie, I, it was that combination of, yeah, brother, same person, 
but another human being altogether, another world, a closed world, a world that was absolutely closed to me. Your brother wrote, I talked with Robbie for three hours. It was the first time in life we had talked that long, and it had taken guards, locks, and bars to bring us together. Yeah, that, that's ironic. Uh, I remember the only other time we tried to talk is when I first got in trouble. And, and he came home from Philadelphia, and they got me out of the trouble, and they brought me home. And so Mom said, John, you take him upstairs and you talk to him. So we went up to my room and we cried. We didn't, I mean, I mean, we were both pretty grown by now. I mean, I was maybe 19. And he tried to, you know, the question was, Robbie, what are you doing? What's, what's going on with you? Why are you? And he started crying. I tried to answer him, well, John, and, and the tears, and we were just both bubbling over with tears. And finally we said, okay, and we hugged and, and that was it. And, and we couldn't talk because well, our worlds were so different, you know, he, it was almost like he knew, what can I tell you, you know, what can I say? And it was like, I know, what can you say? You know, you see what I'm going through, what can you say? And uh, there was just no words that fit, so we cried, and, and we went downstairs, you know, and I said, I'll be good, and he said, you'll be good, and I said, I'll be good, you know, but there, we just couldn't communicate. What's in, what impact is, is this? Head on your mother. It's been devastating, you know. Uh, the greatest pain I'll probably ever suffer is is knowing how much this hurts her. Not just when it happened, but every day. You know, every day I know that she sheds a tear, and if not a tear from her eye, at least in her heart. And uh, it's it's continual. I feel sometimes that she hurts just as much as I do. It's almost as if she's in that cell with me. Um, I know she goes through her life and smiles and tries to live it, but uh, I know that she's feeling this pain almost as much as I do. I mean, and we talk and we write and, and we know it, you know, and I, like I said, that's probably my greatest pain and I know it devastates her and I, if only, you know, I could turn back the hands of time. It just doesn't work like that. Why do, you, why do you think you deserve another chance? Why do you think you deserve parole? I'm responsible for what I did, and I don't want to change that. And I don't want to diminish the fact that a man was killed and the seriousness of the crime. But I didn't shoot the man, and uh, I've tried to turn my life around. And... Uh, most of all, I don't think I'm a killer. I don't think that I'm a threat to society. I think I can be a benefit to society, especially to my family and the people that care about me. You, you were a person who, who used people, who misused people, who abused people. You robbed, you stole, you were a junkie. Mm -hmm. All of that's behind you? Uh, what well, a real test would be when I get out. I, you know, it's easy for me to say, yes, that's all behind me. You know, and that's what anyone in my position sitting in this chair would say. And that's almost too easy to say. But the truth of it is, as far as I know, I believe those things are behind me. His effort to change his sentence has been turned down by authorities. This fall, Robbie will again petition the parole board to change his sentence to life with parole, giving him a chance to eventually get out of prison. What would you say to, to young kids? What advice do you give to them? I think about that a lot because I have a son that's 13 years old now. And so I try to tell him, but the best thing I think I can tell him is to look at me. Look at me. I've been in jail now for nine years. I wasted 34 years on foolishness thinking I knew what I was doing not listening to anybody older than me because they didn't know what they were talking about. The best thing I can do is show them myself and say, look at me. Look what happened to me because I knew all the answers, because I knew better than my parents what I should and shouldn't do.